Welcome again, and thank you for joining us for t today for session two of our two-part webinar series titled Gold Standard Physiological Measurements and Novel Drug Delivery Methods. My name is Martin Hess from Inside Scientific, and I will be your host for today's event. We are happy to announce that almost 200 scientists from around the world have registered for this very informative and educational series of webinars, and I'd like to personally extend a warm welcome and thank you to all of you who've taken the time out of your schedule to be with us today. Our webinar today is sponsored by Prime Tech Corporation, manufacturer of Ipricio infusion pumps, and will feature a presentation by Dr. Robert Doyle called Synthetic structural and mechanistic investigations of vitamin B12 conjugates of the anorectic peptide PYY336. Professor Robert Doyle obtained his PhD in chemistry at the University of Dublin, Trinity College, Ireland, and was an Anderson postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Chemistry at Yale University, USA, before he took his joint faculty appointment at Syracuse University and the State University of New York Upstate Medical University. His research is currently funded by the U.S. National Institutes of Health and has been licensed to several U.S.-based customers uh, companies. Research in Dr. Doyle's lab focuses on two main areas that join medicinal chemistry and pharmacology. The first area of focus is utilizing the vitamin B12 dietary pathway to deliver and or target peptides proteins. The second area of focus is the coordination chemistry of metal pyrophosphate complexes, focusing on the use of cobalt in the treatment of tuberculosis. During his presentation today, Dr. Doyle will discuss, amongst other things, how challenges to peptide-based therapies such as rapid clearance, ready degradation by hydrolysis or proteolysis, and poor blood-brain barrier transport were overcome by using vitamin B12 in a subcutaneously administered drug peptide bioconjugate. So thank you for the invitation. I will talk today primarily about research focusing on PYY3-36 and in particular on how we want to modify PYY3-36 to um, present it as a, as a potential pharmaceutical for the treatment of obesity in particular. Um, so from my perspective, I'm very interested in endocrine disorders. Mo most of the research I've been doing over the last five, six, seven years has been related to type 2 diabetes. But the endemic and you know epidemic proportions of obesity now, it, it, you can no longer ignore the tie-in between obesity and type 2 diabetes. It's not just a United States problem, it's, it's, it's a problem that's becoming worldwide. And there is no really good pharmacopoeia available for the treatment of obesity. There's no low-lying, low-hanging fruit here in terms of developing a treatment for obesity. It's a particularly complex area. Um, that involves obviously a lot of compensatory mechanisms at play um, and a lot of potential side effects um, that have to be overcome if you're going to actually develop a drug that's going to be both functional but functional in the long term and in a safe and meaningful way. Um, and so one of the areas I'm interested in pursuing in this is the utilization of PYY3-36. So PYY itself um, is a 36 amino acid uh, hormone. It's actually truncated by dipeptidyl peptidase 4 to produce the appetite suppressing analog 3 through 36. And 3 through 36 itself um, has been shown to be um, functional in humans when administered exogenously. The really important thing about PYY 3 through 36 is that while it is an enteroendocrine hormone, it has both a neurotransmission capability communicating with the brain directly through a vagal afferent response, but it also needs to cross the blood-brain barrier and function at, in the hypothalamus to actually reduce appetite. So it is a natural appetite-reducing peptide produced in direct correlation to calorie intake and, and or exercise, in fact. And what's really important on top of that, it's not just the natural appetite suppressor, but it actually uh, has been shown that obese individuals are not resistant to it, and that's critical. That is not the case with leptin, which generated a lot of excitement several years ago, where there is significant resistance to leptin exogenously administered. There is not to PYY236 in, in, in data collected to date. 
Um, my interest has been in both improving the pharmacokinetics, um, but also uh, you know expanding on the pharmacodynamics of PYY 36 and that's what I'll talk about today. We have demonstrated already that we can modify PYY 36 by conjugation to a vitamin, vitamin B12, and actually demonstrate oral uptake at clinically relevant levels in rats. Um, that work is currently ongoing. Today, what I wanted to talk about more in line with the use of the microinfusion pumps, although we have used microinfusion pumps to administer conjugate into the gastric fundus for oral studies as well. But really what I wanted to talk about today was the effect of B12 conjugation on subcutaneous administration, which is unknown what effects B12 might have on a peptide subcutaneous administration, and in particular on a peptide's blood-brain barrier passage. And PYY is an ideal case here to study both questions in terms of utilizing vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 itself um, is uh, a B vitamin. It's absolutely necessary for the production of DNA and for the production of proteins. Um, we have to obtain it from our diet. As you can see, looking at this beautiful molecule, it's very prone to hydrolysis. It's rapidly degraded. Um, and because we can't make it and we have to acquire it from our diet, it has to run the gauntlet of both the gastric pH and then down through the uh, um, um, intestines and actually be then passaged across the ileal enterocyte into the bloodstream and then be taken to proliferating cells, get out of the lysosome, be transported to the mitochondria, etc. And there are a slew of proteins and receptors all at work whose sole function is to both bind B12, protect B12 from hydrolysis, passage B12 across the enterocyte, get it into cells, get it where it needs to go, and then it's actually utilized. And so what we're trying to do, and what I'm interested in doing, is utilizing this vitamin B12 pathway that already exists in humans and exploit it for either oral delivery or improved subcutaneous absorption or improved blood-brain barrier passage, etc. And when I talk about using it for something like PYY through to 36, we have to be particularly conscious of the fact that when you're looking at food intake or body weight reduction, that handling of the animals is particularly uh, confounding because inducing stress or inducing a fight or flight response, et cetera, is going to play havoc with our data collection. And if we're dealing with subtle changes, that can be the reason we lose out on seeing something or you know, we wouldn't otherwise. And obviously that's, that's something that we're really, really conscious of and we're very concerned about as we began to do this project. How are we going to be able to know if we do oral or subcutaneous administration that we're not inducing a stress response that essentially negates the data we collect at the back end in terms of food intake and body weight as they pertain to our study. So this is the B12 pathway. It's highly complicated. I'll, I'll sort of skip through this a little bit. But in essence, all of these proteins and, and receptors that are at play are all solely in place to allow you to access vitamin B12. And without such, there are a myriad of diseases associated with B12 deficiency, pernicious anemia being the classic disease. In essence, you have a protein in saliva called haptocorn HC, which binds B12 in the saliva. It protects B12 through the stomach. Haptocorn is completely resistant to uh, gastric pH. Haptocorn is degraded by pancreatic proteases in the duodenum and is passed over to intrinsic factor, which, while produced, in the gastric parietal cells does not pick up B12 until it's in the intestine. It then transports B12 to the ileum where it's docked to cubulin which is partnered with amnionlis, the so-called QBAM receptor which facilitates ileal enterocyte passage. How exactly B12 ends up on the actual serum side is still somewhat debated. There are some, some different possibilities but ultimately the B12 is picked up by transcobalamin 2 or TC2 and then transported to proliferating cells or um, recycled through megalin in the kidney. And so there's a whole variety of different uh, sort of um, angles that can be exploited here in terms of peptide or protein drug delivery, either oral protection and serum delivery, solving the two problems of both destruction and passage, um, or indeed exploiting that CD320 receptor at the actual blood-brain barrier interface. So in addition to having CD320 on proliferating cells, CD320 is also on the blood-brain barrier. And so B12 bound to TC2 can be transported into the brain. And the impact of that or exploitation of that for a peptide delivery has never been investigated. So the overall hypothesis then, we've stated the problem, we've given some background. The hypothesis of the work is that if we conjugate B12 to PYY, 
And we will have positive pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic effects in vivo upon subcutaneous administration. And I will focus on SC administration today uh, and the success we had with using the, uh, the pumps in particular. The aims, of course, we have to build the conjugates. We want to test their in vitro agonism. And we want to make sure that they are hitting the right anorectic and not orectic receptors. And then we want to actually conduct the uh, in vivo studies to look at feeding and, and body weight changes. We use classic um, um, coupling techniques. Initially, we modify the vitamin B12. On the left here, you'll notice there is a, a, an acid group off of the ribose moiety of B12. That's normally a, 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 an alcohol. We oxidize that selectively using IBX. We then take this acid-modified vitamin B12. We do standard EDC coupling to produce, um, ultimately, an, an intermediate series of B12 spacer units. We need to ensure, as we build these conjugates, that there is an optimal spacing between the vitamin B12. We want it still to be amenable to binding by those transport proteins. But at the same time, we need to have the PYY close enough to maintain, say, any protective effect, but not too close that we start to affect PYY's activity at its own receptors. So we need to find that Goldilocks spot between not just location on B12 and location on PYY, but distance between those two locations. And so we did a whole series of studies about where to play with B12 and a whole series of studies about where to play with PYY. I'm just going to tell you the success was at the um, four position on PYY and at the ribose group on B12. And then this was a way to just modify the spacer units between them. So we modified the PYY at this K4 position. What we did was we changed it from a, a, an epsilon amine at the lysine position to an epsilon azide. Now with these alkyl modified B12s and this azido modified PYY, we can go ahead and essentially just do standard uh, copper mediated um, um, Sharpless Huygens click chemistry. And we're getting now upwards of 90% yields across the board, single step purity. Um, the protein is perfectly folded as judged by circular dichroism, the molly tough, et cetera. Looks very nice, and we can gain. We can take single peak pure compounds with folded PYY, the correct molecular weights of all the different spacer units. Um, Western blots look perfect as well. Everything looks um, straight down the middle. So we're pretty happy with the synthesis now, and we can do this up at 50 milligram scales now. So we're actually able to make quite considerable um, amounts of the starting materials. So once we have the starting materials, aim two is to actually show that there's still function. So we're particularly interested in knowing that it will still work at the Y2 receptor. The Y2 receptor is the business end of PYY3236 function. We need to hit that Y2 receptor to induce the anorectic or, or you know, um, appetite stim yeah, reducing effect. Now, native PYY3236 can also, although at considerably lower affinity, bind the Y1. And the Y1 has an orectic or appetite stimulating effect. We do not want to see activity at Y1. We want to see activity at Y2. That's something that we need to assay for. And we need to also assay for whether or not placing vitamin B12, which is about 1,350 Daltons in size, has had an impact on PYY, which is about 4 kilodaltons in size. So we've made PYY considerably larger. And we also have to bear in mind that there will be additional binding to those transport proteins around the vitamin B12 as well. So there's considerable concern that we might greatly mitigate the PYY's function at its receptor. And that's something that we really, really want to be you know, conscious of. In addition, we want a component control. We want to know that, even, you know, that we can actually see a result that's completely and utterly dependent on um, the entire conjugate's exact makeup. And so we deliberately put vitamin B12 on a region of PYY that we believed would kill all activity. So we would have a component control. Everything component terms would be present and correct, but this one should not work, intentionally should not work. The way we do the signaling is we designed a series of assays in collaboration with the Holtz Lab at Upstate Medical University um, to actually follow a non-sort um, of physiological G-PCR response for PYY336. Normally, PYY336 induces a GI coupled response, which essentially means a reduction in background cyclic AMP levels. That's a particularly challenging uh, um, sort of uh, marker to follow. We've subsequently designed a new GI assay that, where we artificially raise the cyclic AMP using Xendin-4 in GLP-1R 
stably transfected hex cells. That then gives us a diagnostic window to see how much we can mitigate that upregulation cyclic AMP by adding in these conjugates and PYY is a native control. And that's something we haven't published and it's something that um, we're not ready to share here today. But what we have been doing is following a, a promiscuous G-coupled receptor that will dock in vitro to the Y2R that we've, we've transfected into a variety of different cells and then actually follow either the um, triphosphorylation of inositol by adding in radio-labeled myo-inositol and or following through a fluorescence assay the calcium-induced calcium response. So we get an upregulation of calcium which it's set in the cytosol which then triggers a calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum and we can actually follow a dose response uh, against that calcium um, concentration increase and we can do that fluorescently. Simply put, I'll just show you the calcium induced calcium response. We just use Fura2 which once it enters the cell um, um, is activated, it binds calcium and we get a fluorescence response and we can generate a series of, of dose response curves and actually get effective concentrations. And as you can see when we measure the three different conjugates, one, two and three noted here in green, maroon and blue, um, the only difference between 1, 2, and 3 is the number of carbon spacers. So 1 is the closest B the B12 and PYY get, 2 is slightly further away, an additional methylene spacer, and 3 that has an additional methylene spacer again. And you'll actually notice that uh, conjugate 2, which has that 2 carbon spacer, or 2 methylene bridge, actually has an EC50 of about 27 nanomolar which is actually pretty close to the 16 nanomolar we see for native PYY through 36. So that's the sort of reddish color you see running close to the blue line that is native PYY through through 36. And you'll notice that if we're too close or too far away, we're seeing effects uh, that are mitigating the effective concentration. So if it's too close, it's not working as well. And if it's too far away, it's not working as well. There seems to be a Goldilocks spot. Now the effect is not even a log order of difference. This is a subtle effect, but nonetheless, um, we moved forward with all subsequent studies utilizing this highly potent conjugate number two. And so you'll see that I'll refer to it as conjugate two for the rest of the talk. That's the one with the 27 nanomolar EC50, which is obviously pretty close to the 16 nanomolar EC50, telling us that having B12 at that K4 position with that particular space or unit length is um, pretty good at not hurting the PYY336 function you know, at all or in any real meaningful physiological manner. Um, we do understand why that is the case and I'll be happy to answer questions uh, about that if anybody wants to know. We have full molecular dynamics constrained by full NMR studies um, and we're writing that paper up for submission later this month um, which will explain all of that. But we also looked at Y1 stimulation. You can see against the native control which is 1 through 36 which is the non-truncated form that's actually expressed initially endogenously, uh, you see that the EC50 is about 10 nanomolar. Native 3 to 36 has a little bit of function, but it's obviously minimal at 620 nanomolar. But you can see for the conjugate 2, it's, you know, we're in micromolar terms now. It's essentially not effective in, in any meaningful manner at the Y1. So uh, that's good. We have really good function at Y2, which is what we want. And we have, if anything, even worse function at Y1, which is also good. So we're very happy with conjugate 2. Um, and as I said, we saw this NMR structure, uh, everything looks, looks pretty nice. Um, we also built a null control, as you can see. The reason we think um, um, placing the B12 at the N terminus, as you can see that there's a two binding pocket for the Y1 receptor. Both the N and C terminus uh, or termini are involved in binding to the actual Y1, but only the C terminus is critical for recognition of PYYC236, uh, 3236. So by removing those first two amino acids, the uh, tyrosine and proline, the first two amino acids in endogenous 1 through 36, you're basically greatly favoring Y2 over Y1 receptor naturally. So by placing the B12 at the end terminus, we're not hurting the recognition at Y2, but of course we're greatly further hurting the interaction with the, uh, with the with the Y1 receptor, which is good. We exploited that then to build a null control. Simply we placed the B12 at the critical C-terminal end, and we would expect that in that case, that should work um, um, with no function whatsoever. I mean, that should have basically no function whatsoever. And this, incidentally, was we actually utilized uh, SPDP chemistry to produce what is actually the first disulfide-linked uh, B12 uh, peptide conjugate that we've we've seen 
Um, in any case, we screened across all both receptors. Uh, we have all the controls in place. We know we have excellent function at Y2. We have no function at Y1. We have almost comparable function at Y2 compared to native PYY336. And we have a control in the form of conjugate number four, the other number to remember today. That one is the one that should not function. Okay, and that's what we're actually um, going to pursue today. So as we moved into the actual guts of today's talk, which is all about the uh, the actual in vivo work, just bear in mind that we have large scale production of highly pure, greater than 98% pure, um, highly selective functional Y2 receptor conjugates in place, and, and that's conjugate number two. We have PYY3 to 36 as a positive control in all of these studies. And we have conjugate four component control that should serve as a negative uh, control in all of these experiments. So we're going to talk about PYY3 to 36, conjugate two, which is functional, and conjugate four, which is non-functional. And we're going to do this in rats. Okay, this was all performed by my graduate students uh, in collaboration with um, Dr. Christian Roth, who's an MD endocrinologist at Seattle Children's Hospital, and his technician, Clinton Elfers. Um, and what we really wanted to do was, first of all, in initially optimize dosing. We needed to uh, acclimate the rats, then do PD and PK analysis, elucidate the mechanism of action, and then extend to actually look from both lean Spragdali animals and move into actual obese, uh, either diet-induced obese or pre-diabetic Zucker rats. Um, and I'll share some of the preliminary data we have on line number six there towards the end. So the first thing we did was a dose escalation study. We looked at various time points. 180 minutes was what worked best for us. So you can see when we looked at a three-hour food intake at a variety of different doses, we found that you know, 10 nanomoles per kilogram of the actual conjugate and or PYY, in fact, worked optimally in really showing us that we had functional food intake reduction over a short period of time. So initially, we needed to know that we had something functional. And on top of that, what dose we should pursue in moving forward. We do see some reduction in, in food intake at the 5 nanomoles per kilogram. It wasn't as potent as the 10 nanomolar, but it was a good level to use as a maintenance dose. And the really nice thing about the utilization of the um, um, prime tech pumps is that you can not just schedule a dosing uh, regimen, but you can actually vary the dosing at various different time points. In, in, in our case, in the light or dark cycle, we were able to do 10 nanomoles per kilogram, three dosing over the light cycle, uh, or dark cycle, I should say, and then uh, two maintenance doses over the, essentially, the, the non-eating cycle, and they were asleep. So the other thing you have to worry about when you utilize these pumps is you're going to say to yourself, I'm doing a food intake study. I, I'm really worried about stress, and that's absolutely true. You don't want to have confounding variables associated with the handling of the animals. But also, you've got to ask yourself, I'm not going to be constantly administering this dose. The upside of constantly administering the dose is that you can store it under optimal storage conditions to make sure you maintain function, make sure you maintain stability of that conjugate, that you're not worried about it you know, having died on you. In essence, if we're going to do something where we're going to place a pump into this animal and then dose over five, six, seven days, we've gone out to 10 days, you can't have the conjugate or the peptide essentially decompose at 37 degrees placed in this constant, you know, at a highly concentrated level over that period of time, you've got to worry about aggregation and you've got to worry about you know, precipitation that could block patency, of course. And of course, you just could have natural decomposition, unfolding and loss of potency. So one of the things we've done and we always do when we're going to use these pumps for any prolonged period of time is we will measure both the aggregated state over that time period of 37 degrees, but also we will do it um, at, by thermal st you know, stability over those time period of time. We'll look to main, make sure that we maintain function. Essentially, we just main, we keep running assays over different time periods. The other thing I will point out that at the end of the experiment, when we had completed everything in terms of the animal, we always had a little extra solution that we added into the actual pump such that we could recover that solution, measure the volume that was left over, and make sure that what should have been administered in volume terms was, the amount of volume we should have had left at the end was correct, and then we would reassay that volume to bookend the experiment. Functional going in, functional coming out with matching volume controls. It's really important to do that because obviously we're worried about loss of patency but also loss of function, especially when you're talking about placing a protein at 37 degrees for five, six, seven days. You really want to worry about those things. 
And that's obviously something that you want to head off before you actually do the experiments, and that's something that we did. So I just want to throw that up there. And we did do that at relatively high um, concentrations as well. So implanting the microinfusion pumps is very straightforward. Um, in essence, um, my graduate student who had no prior animal training um, went out to Seattle and essentially spent a week basically with a trained technician and that was doing this by the end. This is actually the graduate student at work here. Um, and you can actually see it's a simple uh, incision, uh, insertion, then run the catheter up. In this case, we're looking at subcutaneous injection, so we're, you can see the catheter being inserted down here. And you can do this under standard isofluorane conditions. And the rat's back up and happy within a few days, um, and you're good to go from that point on. So we knew we had a really good way to actually control for uh, dosing here because now we've got everything in place. We know everything is stable and pure and clean and functional. We've placed it into the animal. There's going to be no stress. We just got to sit back, place the animals in metabolic cages, and then actually record data over our selected time period. Um, and as I said, we're up to 10 days and we're pushing out. We want to do a 28-day study now and see um, with, with pump, um, every seven days we'll restock the pump in that 28-day cycle um, term. But what we had here was a dosing schedule where, as you can see, every four hours, we set the pump to give a 10 nanomoles per kilogram, um, essentially per hour dosing. So you can see the initial dose, 240, 480, and then we had two 5 nanomoles per kilogram per hour baseline doses that we gave over the light cycle. And we did not allow food for one and a half hours prior to the start of the dark cycle. So this was a really neat use of the pumps because we didn't want continuous infusion. We wanted to set a dosing cycle and we wanted to be able to lower that, that functional dose over the light cycle just to maintain a background level of the exogenous peptide or exogenous conjugate. And you can actually see that both for the for conjugate two and the, at the top and then PYY at the bottom, that against the purple solid line, which is normal food and con controls, you can see the drop down for in both red and blue when the conjugate's administered. And you can see the feeding rate goes back up above the blue line in between. Um, and that's really what we wanted to see. We wanted to see a drop in intake associated with the dose, and then we wanted to see that dose wane off and then drop down again and go back up and come down again. And actually look to see what our um, you know, on-off rates were really, and also what effect this dosing schedule would have. Um, long story short, um, we looked at both basal, uh, you know, baseline, we had treatment levels, and then we had to follow the compensation mechanism. When, this, when the effects are quite subtle or small, it's particularly important that you look at the compensation phase, and we always do that as a rule anyway, but it's particularly important when you're looking at food intake, I think. And, and you'll actually notice, I think it's easier to see here, that the food intake trends are pretty clear. At five and ten days, uh, with ends of nine or ends of sixes, um, we see a markedly improved um, um, trend towards food intake reduction of about 24% versus about 13% when we actually utilize vitamin B12 conjugates of PYY. So we, it's working better. And we can really tease this out with good statistical significance utilizing the pumps. And so when you do original studies where you're trying to gavage orally or you're doing subcutaneous repeated injections, the data looks nowhere near as clear-cut as this. And so it was really important for us as we move through this to enter into the utilization of the pumps. It really, really made our life a lot better. And the data became a lot clearer as we went along. And as you can see, conjugate four on the left side is an excellent null control. There's no function whatsoever. You go to conjugate two, you do see the drop-off versus um, PYY. And then you'll notice that in the case of two, there appears to be a greater compensation, uh, subtle and not statistically significant, but trending towards greater compensation, which would make sense. As soon as we stop treatment, the animal has lost more weight and is more hyperphagic, and then we'll try to overeat to compensate for the loss of that um, um, food intake. So that, that fits with the idea of what we're looking at. Body weight gain was markedly improved as well, as you can see, uh, if we look at that as a marker. Um, what was really interesting to us too, and what the pumps allowed us to do as well, was actually look for how long, what the on rate was. So in other words, how, were, they, were, they, were they actually turning on at the same time? Because we're administering PYY and we're administering B12 PYY, and they have to go through the subcutaneous tissue. So what was the duration to on? So what was the, the pulse nadir, and then what was the pulse duration? And you actually see that they both start at the same time. So the time from start of pulse is comparable for PYY and conjugate 2. 
whereas the duration, start of pulse to end of nadir, was actually greater for two. So it looks like we had improved uh, subcutaneous absorption. The other thing that was really interesting was the fact that we got unified dosing for each of the three pulses, where we had very marked difference in the amount of absorbed PYY based on pulse one, pulse two, and pulse three, statistically significant and reproducible. So um, it definitely appears that uh, there's either a circadian rhythm to the PYY through 36 that, that may be at play here, um, that's being over, you know, it's being overcome with the B12, um, but whatever the case may be, and we're obviously still working our way through this, each of the three pulses of the B12 PYY was comparable in its change of food intake where there was significant variety uh, for the PYY, and that's also been noticed um, in mammals as well, and in, in, in monkey studies actually. So pretty interesting. We did do pharmacokinetic analysis, and what we observed were minimal improvements in pharmacokinetics, but all of the trends were in favor of the B12 PYY, but nothing astronomically uh, uh, significant here. You'll see there's a, an increased uh, Cmax at the same Tmax, so that just suggests the uptake rate's the same, but the amount absorbed is greater. And as you can see, then, there's a, a greater area under the curve, uh, the volume of distribution, the fractional volume of distribution, because we're using Watson here to calculate out, uh, Watson software to calculate out subcutaneous values. So these are fractions of clearance and fraction of volume of distribution. But all of the conditions favor conjugate 2, which obviously speaks to why it may be working better than the PYY 3236 natively. Um, but of course, as I said, PYY has two main uh, ways it can work and work peripherally. Um, from the gut, there's a vagal afferent response, but in the blood, it can actually communicate to the brain through the circumventricular organs. Um, but its main mode of action is in the brain. And PYY natively crosses the blood-brain barrier and activates those Y2 receptors in the hypothalamus, primarily at the arcuate nucleus and at the SNS. Um, and so we really wanted to know, did we also see an improvement in neuronal response? Did we see neuronal response for the conjugates um, relative to controls? And did we actually see comparable CFOS or evidence of neuronal activity in the arcuate nucleus as a consequence of conjugate 2 administration? To do that, we did CFOS immunohistochemistry. And you'll actually see that conjugate 2 and PYY 3 through 36 have comparable um, um, uh, CFOS immunohistochemistry results, and that the really nice thing is you can see conjugate 4, the null control does not. So that's really, really, really very nice because even though you would expect conjugate 4 to reach the brain because it's containing the vitamin B12 molecule, it can't actually fire that Y2R response, and as you see, we see it looks comparable to saline. So very, very nice to see that too. We then decided we really needed to actually follow this B12 um, PYY, and so the other thing is these pumps and the utilization of these pumps is not uh, um, counterindicated for use with radio tracers, and so what you want to do in, is repeat the study with a radio labeled analog that might allow you to do spec CT or, or, um, or PET tracer imaging studies. In this case, we made a B12 PYY analog um, both at the K4 position for the B12, but at the I3 position uh, utilizing the N-terminal uh, NODA uh, molecule that we linked through with iurea to, cop to carry 64 copper uh, PET tracer, so we'd have a, a way to actually study uptake across the brain this way. Uh, again, we can utilize the pumps for this. You, you can administer the tracer into the pump as well and then go ahead and do, do what you want to do, or you can do straight injections uh, because you're not so worried about stress in this case, but whichever way you want to do it, the, the pumps work well here, and, and we, we utilize them in, in line with standard IV injection or subcutaneous injection. Uh, this study basically shows a simple IV of 15 microcuries of injected 64 copper. And the really cool thing is the CO1 is conjugate 2. Um, it's the same compound. Um, it was called CO1 by our collaborators at the Kermanos Cancer Institute, but it is conjugate 2. And you'll actually notice that we have almost double the uptake rate across the brain. So this is actually the percentage injected dose per gram of brain tissue specifically. So you can see that we got a PYY236 uptake rate of about 0.08 of the injected dose. And that's perfectly consistent with the iodo, uh, radio iodo label PYY studies that Reidelberger produced about 10 years ago. So even though we, we changed it up here a little bit uh, by putting 64 copper on the PYY, we find essentially the same percentage of injected dose per gram of brain tissue for our PYY control. So that's a wonderful internal control there. 
uh, that matches literature and consistent with literature and makes me feel better about the change from the 64 copper from the iota to the 64 copper. But for the conjugate itself, you can see markedly improved, almost twice as much of the PYY entered the brain. And that's probably underpinning why we're getting that greater uh, function and probably why we're getting that greater unified function, in addition to the slightly improved pharmacokinetic response. Um, we have also moved into Zucker rats, and you'll notice that over the, which are the obese pre-diabetic animals, so we've gone up to animals that are greater than 850 grams. Um, and actually we're seeing, again, marked improvement in average food intake for conjugate 2 versus PYY 336. Um, and what's really interesting is you can actually see that both in the treatment phase, but again you can see in the compensation phase they're catching up. They're essentially becoming comparable in the compensation phase, which means the drug is working and when you take away the drug, the animal compensates for it, um, which is something that is a long-term problem with obesity medication development as a whole anyway. Um, the really other interesting thing as I conclude and summarize here is that we have got some really nice data that suggests that both PK and PD are, uh, are greatly benefited by having vitamin B12 tethered to a peptide, in this case PYI336. We do see a marked uh, improved response. We do see some uh, you know, improvement in pharmacokinetics. We do see greater brain uptake. And as you can see in the bottom right hand corner here, as after about the fourth day in the Zucker rats, the PYY started to wane. So we continued out the study to 10 days with the B12 PYY, so the actual conjugate 2, and you can see that we're getting a continued dosing effect of B12 PYY at 10 days in these Zucker animals, which you would expect to see prolonged improvement in an obese model versus a lean model because of hyperphagic responses and starvation responses. So this is really exciting. It's as you go into obese animals and you go out to longer time periods, the effect of conjugation of B12 on the peptide becomes more and more pronounced. And so it's really, really uh, encouraging to see that data as we move beyond the, the early time points in lean models to later time points in obese models. We're really seeing more and more improvement in the actual effect. The differences between PYY336 and B12 PYY336 become more and more markedly pronounced, which is obviously really exciting in addition to that brain uptake improvement that we saw, which translates, of course, to other peptide utilization. And the pumps were really, really helpful for dealing with that. Now, the compensation I, I mentioned is something that we want to overcome. Uh, we've just recently filed a patent on something we've been working on for the last year and a half, which is to find a super PYY. And we have developed a PYY that's now both functional at the Y2 receptor and the GLP-1 receptor, which means we can both control uh, endogenous glucose levels and mitigate the appetite response. Um, in addition to that, it appears that one of the systems that we built has biased agonism at the Y2R, which means it's not necessarily playing the same uh, um, pathway um, response that normal PYY is. We don't know what manifestation that might have. We do have a series that do behave themselves and have normal GI response, but we're really interested in that biased agonism because we don't want to have compensatory effects, and we certainly don't want to have a mitigation of function because of beta arrestin, for example, you know, mitigating the signal over time. So we're particularly interested in translating all of this work out to obese models at longer time periods, but also to switch out that PYY and bring in these sort of biagonist and potentially biased biagonist conjugates to actually produce something that would make itself into a, a serious therapeutic candidate. I should thank the people who fund this, which are the NIH, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the people who have licensed the work and who, who fund it in part as well, or Zerogenics. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, Dr. Doyle, can you elaborate on the sources of um, the hyperphagia or compensation that was observed in your studies and this ELF-PYY in general? I'm sure. So that the Compensatory mechanisms are really uh, a consequence of the natural starvation response. So you're getting an endocrine response to the fact that you're going to have energy reduction and you're going to have essentially your body knowing you're not eating what you need or what you're used to actually ingesting. And it will start to override PYY3236 specifically in this case since we're talking about PYY3236. It will start to override PYY3236 function. So you will see leptin changes, ghrelin changes, alpha MSH changes, and essentially what your body will say, right, no more off, we're going to enter an on phase. And that's why it's so difficult to uh, produce 
you know, a, a weight reduction, especially a long-term weight reduction therapy that has minimal side effects and actually maintains any kind of meaningful function over, you know, a year or two years, uh, is really, really, really difficult because it's quite easy to overeat. Uh, it turns out um, it's very difficult to undereat. And that's an evolutionary starvation protection mechanism. And so that's something that we're going to have to greatly overcome. It's not just a mitigation of signal at the GPCR, which of course is another problem with the targeting of the GPCR specifically. It's got to do with normal starvation or hyperphagic responses. Um, major, major, major problem in developing an obesity medication. Okay. Uh, thanks for that response. Um, you've also um, shown that um, vitamin B12 seems to have uh, improved absorption and blood brain barrier uptake uh, as per one of your slides towards the end, but uh, does it offer any proteolysis protection? By itself, actually it does. Um, we've done a study with, with uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and with um, meprin beta, which is a major brush border kidney-based uh, protease. And we've actually shown this not with PYY, but with Exendin-4, which is a, a Novo Nordisk medication, or a basis of a Novo Nordisk medication to treat type 2 diabetes. And that the B12 itself does offer some protection against proteolysis against all three of those, intestinal and, and, and kidney-based. Uh, but that it's really pronounced when the B12 is itself then bound up by its protecting um, protein, which of course would be the endogenous state of any B12 PYY. When I keep talking about B12 PYY, what was entering the brain and functioning in the brain would have been a transcobalamin 2 bound B12 PYY. So you would have also had a 50 kilodalton um, protein wrapped around the B12, if you will. Um, and that's obviously showing the greatest improvement in function. And we've shown that in that case, uh, and in a situation where the Exendin-4 is completely degraded, um, we still have 100% of function uh, relative to that completely degraded uh, Exendin-4. So yes to the B12 itself, but markedly when you consider it that it will actually endogenously be bound up by a natural transport protein. OK, great. Um, Another question, why would a biased agonist potentially overcome compensation? Well, it may, it's unlikely. I think the main benefit of a biased agonist would be, uh, if it was going to do that, would be it would change the tissue responses. So it would change the response from uh, a particular set of tissues to another. And that might actually mitigate the compensation. But it also might be that it will uh, at least prolong the function of the conjugate because, or of the particular pharmaceutical, because you won't get that GPCR uh, mitigation effect, which of course our, our GPCRs are famous for. If you add morphine for a prolonged period of time, obviously you need more and more morphine um, to get the same response, and that's because of a consequence of the dampening of that GPCR response. Um, in this case, with a biased agonist, we would hope to only go down, for example, the, the pathway we want and leave the, the nullifying or mitigating pathway uh, un, unactivated such that we don't see a dosing change or a need for increased doses to achieve the same response over time. So I think changing this, the tissue specificity, modifying which GPCR we target, and or uh, overcoming that uh, GPCR mitigation response, all of that would certainly lend itself to greater function. Whether it would lend itself to overriding long-term compensatory mechanisms, though, is a big question. Okay, great. Um, Michelle asks, um, how much of your PYY effects are due to changes in leptin sensitivity? Can you comment on that? Yeah, we haven't looked at leptin levels. Um, that's actually a really good question. Um, one of the things we believe is, is, is playing havoc with us is, is leptin changes. I think where we're seeing the compensation kick in again is tied to leptin. Um, and one of the things we're actually going to do, and one of the things we've written to the NIH to support us doing, is to actually start co-administering this conjugate with an antagonist. So something um, like an oxytocin, for example, as well as look at leptin levels and, and, and actually see where all this is playing out. So that's all on the to-do list. But leptin is a concern, something we want to look at. Uh, Co-administration of an antagonist like oxytocin as well is something we want to do. I think that might also lend itself to 
overcoming some of those uh, negative pathways, if you will, to, to, to why we're seeing compensation. What we're particularly encouraged by, though, is the, the Zucker rat data over longer periods of time. We seem to be seeing more and more improvement. The bigger the animals are and the, uh, the longer time point we look at. But yeah, leptin's on our to-do list. Okay, great. Uh, and thanks, Michelle, for your, your question. Um, we've had a few questions, you know, directed um, or that pertain specifically to the technology. I will mention briefly that um, Prime Tech, our sponsor, does have a lot of resources available for you, uh, including technical specifications, publications, surgical uh, videos, and all of those resources and links to those resources will be made available uh, as part of our follow-up to this, this session. But um, Robert, perhaps you can comment, you know, in terms of your experience with these mini pumps, you talked about how easy the surgery is, but can you comment on the programmability and how you know, what the best resources were for you in terms of learning how to program the pumps and use them? Uh, well, like I said, I, we, we took a medicinal chemistry PhD student, and between a Monday and a Friday, they were completely <laughs> off by with their they're, they're very straightforward. I mean, they do exactly what they say on the tin, so to speak. We've, we've never lost a pump. Uh, we've never had a student screw up, if you will. Um, and we've done it now on, on a multiple of occasions. Um, the, actually, I should point out that the first time we used them was also the first time the technician himself had ever actually used them. Uh, he was, a, he, was a, 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 he is a highly skilled uh, veterinary technician. Um, so he was in an ideal place to pick it up, but he picked it up immediately without any questions, without any issues, without any confusion whatsoever. So they're very user friendly, and with any kind of comparable, well trained technician, they they've they've worked really well. And he's been able to then pass that along to medicinal chemists from my lab who had only basic husbandry training, um, and be able to do surgeries within no time whatsoever, and be able to program the pumps, etc., very quickly. 